Let's, uh, let me pray with you. Father God, I just want to thank you for being you. For being, Scripture says, love. For being justice. For being truth. For being righteousness. Lord, those are not just uh, terms, but they are your character. And thank you for loving us so much that you were willing to let your son die on a cross for us. Thank you that you have enabled us to take off the filthy rags of our works, our effort, our sin, and put on the clean, pure righteousness of Christ. And Lord, thank you for the fact that there's coming a day when we will stand before you holy and able to worship you in person, worship you in absolute spirit and in truth. Thank you for entrusting us with your word, uh, that it's not just an ordinary book, but it is a sharp two-edged sword, Father, that cuts to the heart, not for destruction, but for healing. Uh, Lord, as we come to you, we know that you are wanting to remake us. And according to a conversation I had this morning, to rehab our lives. Uh, Lord, I rejoice in that. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 18, Jesus tells a story about, uh, well, Peter comes to ask Jesus a question, and, and it's a question we've all pondered at times. Uh, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? And then he tells the story about a servant who owed his master an untold fortune. Some suggest in our day it would be millions of dollars. And, and it was finally decided by the king it was time to, to, for this guy to pay up. And so he brings him in and demands payment. And the servant, uh, like most of us, unaware, unable to pay the debt, says, please give me more time, I will repay you every penny. And he throws himself on the mercy of the king, and the king says simply this, not only do I give you more time, but I forgive the debt. Go. And so the man leaves. The story goes on as the man leaves, having just been forgiven a, a debt that was overwhelming, runs into a friend of his that owed him ten bucks. That's a number I'm just throwing out there. Just oop, Comparisons were just... And instead of saying, you know, I just received grace and mercy from my king, I think I'll just let it slide and tell him it's forgiven. But instead he goes over and demands payment. I want my ten bucks. And the guy says, just don't have it right now, give me time, I'll pay you back. And instead of saying, well, okay, I'll give you time or I'll forgive it, the man grabs him and begins shaking him and demands that he be paid. And because the man can't pay him, has him thrown in jail. And naturally, the word gets back to the king. I, I can almost envision it happening right outside the palace as he comes down the steps. And so the guards are there, and they go in and say, Majesty, you just can't believe what we just saw happen. And without wasting any time, the king orders the man brought back in and reminds him, I forgave you millions, and yet you couldn't forgive this friend of yours ten bucks. He says, you should have extended mercy as I extended mercy to you. And then he had the man thrown in prison until the day he could repay him. He rescinded the forgiveness. He took back his mercy. I thought about that story as, I, as I've reflected on Romans 12 through 16, because Romans 12 up till chapter 12 has been all about God's mercy and grace, and those are two qualities that go hand in hand. Mercy keeps, keeps us from receiving what we deserve. Grace gives us what we could never earn. God in his mercy keeps, uh, prevents us, or does not send us to hell as we deserve, does not punish us as we deserve, but withholds it. Grace gives us forgiveness and life for eternity. And Paul has been building that case all through the first 11th chapters. And last week we came to chapter 12 and we started with a word, therefore. So what? 
And we talked about a great deal about the fact that God wants our lives. Not just our words, not just our moments, but He wants our very life. Our life submitted to Him as a living sacrifice. And we talked about not conforming, but being transformed. And that word is very key to everything that goes on here. Because He talks in the next four chapters about that transformation because God has been merciful to you this is what you should look like this is in chapter 13 verse 14 he says put on Christ Jesus clothe yourself with Christ Jesus and he said this is what it looks like this is what Jesus in the flesh looks like and this is the way you are to manifest that in the world that you live in. And we looked last week about the fact that we need to have sober understanding, judgment of who we are and interactions with people. Talked about dealing with our enemies, talking about being uh, do, overcoming evil by doing good and that evil we talked about was the evil in us to keep Satan from having an avenue to tempt us. Chapter 13, he carries on that theme and he shares with us three qualities, I, I think, that characterize the Spirit of Jesus in, in a couple of different or several different uh, avenues. And I want to begin with verse 1 and I'm going to read down through verse 7 to look at the first one. It says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the one in authority, then do, or free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good, but if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. The very first quality I want us to, to grab out of this today is that the spirit of Jesus, putting Jesus into flesh in our lives, is a life of submission. Submission to governing authorities. Now there is a topic that, that is high on everybody's list, isn't it? Government. I, it's no different today than it was then. I, I would almost guarantee you if you walk down the streets of Corinth, you walk down the streets of Rome, you walk down any street, one of the main subjects was, what do you think of the government? There were those who loved it, those who didn't. Those who were living off the benefits, uh, beneficence of the government, those who wanted to be free, all kinds. of. I would almost imagine the discussions we have today about government haven't changed much from that first century. And yet Jesus or Paul comes to us and said, now when it comes to governing authorities, and they were living under one of the cruelest, one of the, the most uh, uh, anti-Christian governments that you could have found. And Paul says, now when it comes to governing authorities, submit. There's a word that's on our top ten things of do, right? Submit. It's a military term. It, it literally means to line up under. And now if I had five or six people come up here and I just asked them to, to line up according to height or line up according to age, that would be an illustration of what submission is. It's, it's putting yourself in the right place. Understanding who I am in relationship to God's plan. So that's, he says, submission. Finding your, we'd call it the pecking order. Knowing where we fit in that and finding it and working and living in that place. And then he uses the word governing authorities. Now, let, before we get into that, let me just offer a couple caveats. 
when he says governing authorities, Paul is not describing any particular form of government. He's not saying that that a, a representative democracy is the best way, even though we think it is as Americans. He's not saying that, that dictatorship or anything else, or communist or whatever it is, those are, he's not talking about specific governments, he's talking about the concept of human government. That is, is from God. It was God's plan. Because it was through, God, through human government that order and peace are sustained in a society. Imagine what it would be like even as bad as it is today, imagine what it would be like if there was no government, if there was no police, if there was no military in our nation today. Even as bad as the government, we think the government may be, there are a lot of benefits. Think about how bad the highway system would be if we didn't have government. Even though it's bad today. We would have no electricity. We would have a lot, of, a lot of the things that we enjoy today would not be here if it wasn't for the government kind of putting all that together. Even as bad as Rome was, Rome provided the world with what people called the Pax Romano, the Roman peace. You could travel almost anywhere in the known world at that time on highways without fear of running into wars. Criminal activity was was at a minimum because Rome was in control. They're from God. And he points out, let's look at this because he talks about two purposes. Number one, he says God God has given us governing authorities. and, And let's not limit it just to government. Let's also talk about all the authorities in your life. Kids, parents, uh, your boss at work, your teachers, your coaches, uh, any avenue, any person who is an authority over you is being spoken of here. And he tells us the purpose. Number one, God has given us governing authorities to commend the good. How many have been commended by the government lately for doing what's right? They thank you for paying your taxes? Oh. That's a, that's a role of government, to, to see people who are doing and being, doing the right thing and commending them. And it's also to punish the wrongdoer, to maintain order. And let's notice here, the sword. It bears the sword. He is a servant of, he uses the word wrath. God has ordained human government to be the one to carry out punishment of crime. Even up to capital punishment. That's what the sword represents. And those of you who want to debate whether war is right or not, that is the venue of God's authority to maintain the peace and to stand against evil. And so sometimes governments go to war and it is justified it's also a way to measure your government not all governments are good and and god's not endorsing one particular time nor is he saying every ruler in that area is my there by my hand because people have wrestled what how could god put men like hitler or stalin in power that is not what paul is saying Because men who are evil and wicked fight their way to power. God can use them, God can work through them, but he does not bring them to power to do what they do. But let me tell you that it's a way to evaluate a godly government. How do they treat those who are doing right? And how do they treat those who are doing wrong? I'm not going to give you my opinion, but, but, but that's, that's a way to measure. That's a way to evaluate. But God, or Paul's response is, submit. What's, 
a good citizen look like? Because I think that's what he's calling us to be. Oh, he also tells you to give them their due. If you owe them taxes, pay taxes. Uh, You don't have to pay more than you have to, but pay your taxes. Respect, honor. 1 Peter 2.15, Peter says, you know, your response to those in authority over you is a way to silence the words of wicked men. Because they're going to look for every reason to criticize Christians. Be good citizens. How do we do that? I came up with five. This is in our system. As Americans, these are roles of good citizenship. Number one, Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, pray for them. I hope you are praying for your leaders. I hope you're praying for those who are, have been elected to office. Praying for them to have wisdom. Praying for their health. Praying for not their demise. Obey them. I detest the 65 mile an hour speed limit. But it's the law. Do I obey it? (laughs) Participate in the system. Folks, if you're not voting, because what good is it going to do? You're not being a good citizen. If you're not writing letters and making phone calls to to your politicians and your, and your representatives because you disagree, they dis, you disagree with what they're doing, you're not being good citizens. We have that privilege as Americans. Speak out against the wrong. Stand up when you see morals being, the moral fiber of your country being challenged, speak out against it. Speak out against the wickedness and evil. I have had a running debate on Facebook with a, a woman this week because she's just basically telling people, quit bashing the president. And I have written back to her and said, it is my right as a citizen and an obligation of a man who wants to stand for what's right to speak out about what's wrong. When you see something wrong, let people know about it. No matter what the cost. Let me go back, obey them within limits. Uh, Peter and John were told not to preach and they said, well, Yeah, we'd like to obey you, but can't do that because God told us to do something else. Pay taxes, whatever form it may be. And we chafe and we resist, but that's a good citizen. Be good citizens. Look at Jesus' example. He was before Pilate, and Pilate said, I have the power to put you to death. He says, well, you really don't have any power at all, except what God's given you, and... He didn't fight. He didn't rebel. He simply, he submitted. (coughs) Submission. Recognizing governing authority. And he says if you cast off government, he's not talking about, when he talks about rebelling against, that is casting off authority, rejecting authority, and wanting to live your own life by your own rules. He says when you do that, then you got a problem. You're going to be, suffer for it. So the next one, Verses 8 through 10. It's interesting. He says, uh, verse, uh, verse 6 says, whatever you owe. Verse 7, give whatever you owe him. And then he says, let no debt remaining outstanding except the debt, continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. And the commandments do not commit murder or adultery, do not commit murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Let me uh, begin by saying here, Paul is not talking about financial advice here. He's not telling you not to go into debt. Now, we can, we can debate the, the virtues of that, but what he is saying, if you want a financial statement here, is if you owe a debt, pay it. Get it paid off, get it done. But the focus here is of a debt that continues, that never 
has an end. No matter what debts we have, no matter what bills we have, there is a date when they will be paid off, most of them. Whether it's 30 years for your house or 90 years for your credit card, there is a date when you will say, there, I'm done. I owe them no more. Paul says, let no debt remain us. Pay your debts, but there is one debt you will never be able to repay or pay off. And that is the debt to love. It is a continuing debt. A debt that is with you from the first breath you take to the last breath at the end of your life. It's a never a debt where you can say, I'm done, finally. It's a debt that was incurred the day Jesus went to the cross and died for us. As Jesus loved you, it is a debt owed to everyone by everyone. What is it that I owe you? Love. And, and Paul says, love does no harm. My love for you cannot, will not allow me to inflict hurt on you, to lie about you, to steal from you, to, to do whatever it will that would hurt you. Love does not do. That's my debt to you. But it's also, love is my debt to you to be there when you have a need. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. Love your neighbor as yourself. And who's my neighbor? Jesus said, it's whoever's in need. It is a debt with payments to be made daily. Most of us have recurring debts. Some are monthly, some are semi-monthly. Some, what, But the debt of love is a daily debt. And whoever I encounter, whatever situation I find myself in, that is the moment where I have to decide how can I pay my debt today. Paul gives us a good answer in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, the love patient. We, pay, we make a payment on our debt of love by being patient with those with whom it's difficult to be patient with. By being kind. By not envying. By not boasting. What have you got to boast about? By not being proud. Folks, one of the biggest hindrances to love in our life is pride. Because pride keeps me from saying, I need help. You see, because I owe you love and you owe me love, I have an obligation to kill my pride and let you know when I need help. This week I sent out the prayer request and on there I put a parenthesis that says anybody wants to come to Boise and give us a ride home, we would love it. <laughs> Not dishonoring others. Do we honor others? Do we lift them up in the eyes of others? Not being self-seeking. Selfish. What's in it for me? That's not love. Not being easily angered. Well, I don't like that one. Not keeping score. I did the dishes yesterday. I've done the dishes four times this week. How many times have you done it? Not delighting in evil. We make a payment when we rejoice with truth. Protect. We trust. We hope. We persevere. Every day, every act is to be a payment on that debt. He says, when you pay the debt, you fulfill the law. Remember the great question, Matthew 22, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus summed two of them up. He said, number one is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. What do those two commands have in common? Love. Love. Go back to the Ten Commandments. The first four deal with love of God. If I love God, these are the things I'm going to do. The last six deal with loving man. 
I do those things because I love. When I love, I, I fulfill the law. I satisfy the demands of the law. Then there's urgency. Read with me. Okay, wake up. Verse 11. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord. With the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And the word that I came up with on that is to live with a sense of urgency. What does that word look like to you? Dolores and I had an experience this week of urgency. We were heading back from the college on Tuesday, and the car kind of made a sputtering sound. And by the time we neared John and Helen's home, it was more than sputtering. It was like, are we going to make it there? And the further we went, the more urgent it came, became for us to get there. And every traffic light we saw became greater urgency because we were sure if we stopped, it was going to die. And we were going to be stuck. And every moment became more and more urgent to get there. And then after we got there, then it was the urgency of how are we going to get home? And finding a place to work on the car. Urgency. Why do people get a sense of urgency? Why do you get caught up in the urgent? What's that? It has to get done. And there is a deadline, a brief period of time. I work well with urgency. In college, I would go into a class and they would say, by the way, the end of this class, you need to have a 10-page paper done. That's 13 weeks away. <laughs> and so I would play basketball and have fun and then come up to the 12th week And maybe the last day. And I can write a really great paper. The trouble is, I didn't type a great paper. You see, my urgency became Dolores' emergency. <laughs> because I could get it written down, then somebody had to type it, and I couldn't type. So she knew there was a reason I married her. See? Urgency. There is a sense of a deadline. Do you see that in this passage? Fueled by a limited time, he says, wake up. It's time to wake up. Because your salvation is nearer now than when you first began. That salvation is the coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. And Paul says it's getting nearer every day. It's been 2,000 years. I don't know when he's coming. Jesus said he doesn't know when he's coming. The Father does, but I know it's coming, and it could be today. It could be this next moment. And yet, how often do we allow ourselves to become complacent and lazy and say it's been 2,000 years? We still have plenty of time. I have a question I want you to ask you. I want to, well, let's, let's go to Matthew 25, 1 through 13. is the story of the virgins who went to the wedding. They thought they had it figured out. Five of them? No, ten. Ten each? Now my mind just went. Some of them came with oil enough. Others didn't. 
bridegroom came. They were out shopping for oil, got locked out. They should have had a sense of urgency about it. But that urgency, no complacency or laziness, making sure we're ready. How many people have that resolve in their mind that I am going to give my life to Christ someday? I, I'm going to be ready someday. It could be today. Does anybody here know somebody else that isn't ready for that day? What are you doing about it? Oh, I got lots of time. I can do it tomorrow. If I don't get to it tomorrow, I can do it the next day. Or if I can, oh, I'll get to it. And then the alarm goes off. And time is up. I have a question. I, I want to go back to this. I'll go back in a moment, but I want to ask that question. How would you live today if you knew for sure Jesus was coming tonight or first thing in the morning? Would you live any differently? Uh, would you do anything different after church today? W would you do anything different before tomorrow morning comes? Or is there someone you want to tell about Jesus? That's the reality. Jesus said, you don't know the day or the hour it will come as a thief in the night, so be ready. Wake up. Your answer to that question ought to dictate how you live today. Because it could be today. We are so complacent. We have become so lazy in our spiritual walk and in carrying out the mission God has given us. It's time to wake up from our slumber. And then he talks about being clothed properly. He tells us some things to take off, but he also tells us what to put on. Clothe yourselves with Christ Jesus our Lord. Matthew 22, 11 through 14. You know, it used to be a time when it mattered what you wore to church. Not so much today. Does attire matter? Matthew 22, 11 through 14 king threw a wedding feast for his son. Went out, servants went out to bring in the invited guests, and all the invited guests had excuses. One after another, couldn't come, couldn't come, won't come. And so he comes back and he says, go out and invite anybody you find. You know that guy standing on the street corner down there said, we'll work for food, bring him in. You know, the, the guy that lives down in the, in the lower part of town in that cardboard shanty, go get him and bring him in. Anybody that wants to come in. And they all came in and, the, and they were enjoying the feast. And then the king walked into the banquet hall and he found one man. One man sitting enjoying the food and he walked over and said, Sir, how did you get in here without wedding garments? Now, let me back up a moment because at a king's feast like that, there was no reason not to have the garments because he would provide them. How come, how did you get in here without putting on the wedding? You're wearing rags, you kind of smell bad. How did you get in here? And the king said, called his servants over and said, throw him out. Because he was not clothed in righteousness. That God has provided. Clothe yourselves. And he tells you to take some things off. And there's lots of things that we need. This is just a partial list. Behave decently as at daytime. Now, today it doesn't matter so much because people are doing this stuff all the time. But in Paul's day, this stuff happened after dark. There were things that people didn't want to be seen doing. He says, so let's get rid of the nighttime behavior and live like you do during the day. Get rid of the orgies and drunkenness. Get rid of the sexual immorality and the debauchery and the dissensions and jealousy. And then clothe yourselves 
with Jesus. What does that look like? Oops, I don't have the scripture written. Philippians 2. Clothe yourselves with Jesus. Paul says your attitude should be that is the same as with Jesus. Who what? Being God. Did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped or clung to or clutched. But emptied himself. Mind you, who is God? With all the qualities of God, he emptied himself and became what? A man. What a step down. But not only that, became a man taking the form of a servant. The lowest of the low. And humbled himself. It was obedient even to the point of death. You want to clothe yourself with Jesus? There it is. How are we doing? Colossians 3 offers another list. Humility and kindness and gentleness. And he goes on to describe those things. Look like Jesus. Because time is short. You don't know when he's coming. Be clothed in Jesus. And that begins with with the first step in, in getting rid of that initially by coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, I know that I'm unworthy. I know that I'm unfit. I need Jesus. Do you have that sense of urgency in your life? Do you realize that today could be the day? Today is the last moment you have for sure. Have you made provision? Have you accepted the garments of righteousness that God has given you? Because today is the day. Paul said in Corinthians, today is the day of salvation. Maybe it's for some of us who have been wearing those garments, we've kind of lost attention and we've allowed ourselves to kind of begin putting on some of those other garments and maybe today we need to strip those away and let the righteousness of god shine through do we look like jesus for those who have received the mercy of god we live we show the world jesus when we live as good citizens when we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, And when we live with the urgency of eternity. Do we look like Jesus? Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Can we tell our world today who say show us Jesus can we say if you've seen me you've seen Jesus that's our challenge that's what the response to God's mercy is that is a life of our spiritual act of worship to look like Jesus And when we look like Jesus, it's going to make a difference in our community. And it's going to impact people as we've never impacted them before. Father, there's no way we could ever do an adequate job of saying thank you for your mercy and grace. The only thing we can possibly do is to give ourselves to you and with the best effort and through the power of your spirit and and by studying your word to become more like Jesus every day. It doesn't happen overnight. It begins with that step of faith, Lord, to step out and say, I believe Jesus is the one who can cleanse me and make me holy. But it's every day growing to be more like him. Lord, every one of us have a decision to make this morning. 
Every one of us need to be aware that it's time to wake up from our slumber and really get about our Father's business. Lord, help us to show our world who Jesus is. That they might come to know him. Thank you in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.